everyone. Thank you for coming to our um, first in a few years honors program presentations for our two seniors who are graduating this year. Um, and we're just gonna pretty much straight off kick it to them. First, we have Michaela Sexton from the School of Business who is presenting on her event with foster children. Hello. <laughs> so my event was an upstate foster care needs-based assessment and development program. So a little background was, um, so there are many needs in the foster care community, and although a lot of them are already covered by nonprofits in the upstate of South Carolina, uh, there are still many things that foster children go without even though um, they are taken in by families. So my project was intended to reach one of those needs through my event. So the reason why I chose this project was the foster care community has always had a special place in my heart. I was actually adopted when I was really small <laughs> and I was fortunate enough not to end up in foster care. So I've always felt that I needed to give back. Um, some other related projects that I've participated in was Operation Shoebox. Me and another student that goes to SWU um, actually raised enough money to fill 106 shoeboxes to send out overseas. And then I've also done Easter baskets for a local group home and I've I raised $3,000 for um, Christmas for a local group home. So the, I did a beginning survey to decide what type of event I needed to, help, to hold. So this is the demographic information about the people that responded to my survey. Um, as you can see, a lot of people <laughs> were located in upstate South Carolina, and then just a few were located in South Carolina but outside of the upstate, and um, a few were located outside of South Carolina but still in the United States. And then this is the respondent's relationship with foster care children. Um, about half of them had no involvement with foster care children, but the other half had um, an involvement with them or were interested in getting involved with foster care children. Uh, so the event type was a question, what type of event would they like um, for me to, ho to hold? And the top pick was having fun experiences with their foster family. And then the bottom pick was spending more time with their adults. And then this was the best type of event that could be held. Um, for this one, it was a ranking, it was a point system, so for each Thing that was chosen first, they received five points, and whatever was chosen second would receive four points, and etc. So the first thing that was chosen was active games and sports, and then next was crafts, and then a mini fair festival, and then board games, and then a movie night. And then I did what would deter them from attending an event, and this was an option that you could select all that, was um, all that applied. So it will add up to more than 100%, but as you can see, the top pick was cost for the whole family to participate. For foster families, a lot of things like state fairs, it costs a lot of money for them to get in and get their kids to do games and rides and everything. And then the bottom pick was the challenge to gather and transport the entire family. Sometimes it's hard for them to get everybody in the car, get them everywhere, especially with young kids. And then the next was what would persuade them to attend. And the first one was free and reduced cost to participate. As I said, it's really expensive, especially if you're um, fostering a lot of children to get them to do fun things to go out because it's expensive. And then the last one was free transportation to and from the event. And then I asked what would be the best time for the event, and as you can see, Saturday afternoon was the top choice, and Sunday morning was the bottom choice. As you can see, Saturday was always the top choice except for Saturday morning. And my event was called the Carefree Jamboree. And my event was held on Saturday, March 12, 2022 at 1 p.m., 
and it was located at Trinity Wesleyan Church in Central, and it consisted of free food, free games, prizes, inflatables, and the attendance was 27 adults and children. And for me to set up this event, it was kind of hard. <laughs> I'm one person. <laughs> um, I had to recruit a lot of local donors, so that in consisted of going to different um, local businesses in person and emailing them and constantly emailing them kind of annoyingly to see if they would um, help me out. And 100% of my event was actually funded by local donors. And um, outside of the initial marketing, that was funded by the Joyner family. And this is a few pictures from my event. I wasn't allowed to take pictures during the event. Um, when you're a part of the foster care community, they have a really strict rule about taking pictures that are still taking pictures of children that are still in foster care. So I wasn't able to take pictures during the event, but these were taken before the event was held. And after the event was held, I gave out an exit survey and I had 10 people fill it out and they all consisted of the adults and the families. Um, and the average satisfaction rate overall was 4.5 out of 5. And their favorite part of the event was spending quality time with their family. Four people chose that option. And then spending time with other foster families. Six people chose that option. And then the least favorite part of the event was the games. Three people chose that, and most of them said it was because they wanted a wider, a wider variety of games, things that would appeal to all ages. And then seven people chose prizes because there was a lot of sugar involved. They would have rather had physical items than sugar. Um, and then lastly, all 10 of the surveys responded that they would participate in future events if they were held and that they would recommend these events to others. Things that I would definitely improve on would be better time management. I started marketing very late. I should have marketed a lot sooner, so that was definitely something I learned. And then better prizes. Uh, less candy, even though candy's cheap. <laughs> and then more variety of games, something that appeals to all ages. So my plans for the future, this, my end goal was for this event to be a stepping stone in order to create my own nonprofit organization. Um, I'd like to be able to conduct more than one event a year, possibly one every season. Um, and then I have actually already started to talking talking to someone about the process of becoming a nonprofit, and it is a very long process, but eventually the plan is to get there. And then these are a few things I learned. I definitely learned how to plan and budget for an event. It takes a lot of hard work and a lot of people. Um, and I definitely learned a lot about foster families from talking to those who attended the event. I actually talked to one mother who had just picked up her daughter that the night before the event in Greenville and they drove all the way from Simpsonville to come to the event that morning. Um, and then I also learned how to ask for sponsorships from businesses. A lot of them won't respond to you, especially if you're just a college student, so you have to be annoying. <laughs> um, and then I also learned how much actual planning goes into an event, and it's a lot. <laughs> So I also want to give a special thanks to the Joyner family and then the local business donors were Buff City Soap, American Legion, Joe's New York Pizza and Jitters, and then Trinity Wesleyan Church for hosting my event, and then South Carolina Party Rentals for all the inflatables and cotton candy and popcorn machine makers, and then all of the volunteers that helped me with setup, cleanup, and running the event. Any questions? Sounds good to me. <laughs> and our next and final student is Bethany Perrin, who's going to be presenting, oh, did I say it wrong again? Brian, dang it. I always debate in my head. Anyways, um, she's gonna be pre presenting her research on water snakes. Hi guys, this is great. I have a bunch of people in one room and I'm supposed to talk to snakes instead of like just telling people about them. It's great. Um, uh, there, can you still hear me? I'm good. So my project, um, kind of a long name, the Movement Behavioral Patterns of Northern Water Snakes in Riverine Systems and Man-Made Bodies of Water. Um, so I kind of went back and forth on some names because my project does include two parts, so it might be different than what's in the um, program. But 
just to kind of start off, it is broken into two parts. So the first part um, was at Table Rock State Park. It involved me tracking northern water snakes. Uh, I had three of them there, and it focused on their differential behavior movements um, associated with their habitats. And then the second part, which we'll get to later, is um, northern water snakes and midland water snakes uh, recently broken into two subspecies and focusing on how those two are different, um, just in general, not specifically habitat. So there we go. Um, the table rock subject, um, northern water snake, Nerodia sipidon sipidon, um, they, they kind of mimic um, venomous snakes. You can kind of see the banding here. Um, and they can get confused with uh, cottonmouths or copperheads, which cottonmouths aren't even found in this area. That's like Columbia down. Um, and they're often killed because of that. Um, they're water snakes, so they spend most of their time in near water, obviously, and then eat um, fish and amphibians. And then, like I said earlier, like three retract in this, um, in this study. So first location was Table Rock State Park. Um, when you first arrive, you go through this little visitor center, which is this little area right here. Um, and you literally walk through those, uh, walk through that little opening, walk over a bridge, and then one of my snakes was right there. Um, a fountain was one of the snakes that I tracked there. But I also had some that were like way far up in a trail, which I'll get to um, in a little while. All right, awesome. There we go. So, um, two different habitats that were looked at here. Um, the first one was a riverine system, which is on my right, your left, this one. Um, I had two snakes that were found in the riverine systems. Uh, riverine has moving water, brush piles for them to hide in, um, a lot of canopy coverage, a lot of shade. Um, and then the on the other side was the lake, um, man-made lake, uh, stagnant water, low canopy coverage, little brush piles, um, little shade. Um, so those are the two habitats that I focus the study on. And then kind of get into that way the methods here of how I track them. So I use this thing called radio telemetry. Um, basically to break it down in word form, a little transmitter about the size of a AA battery is inserted into the snake. Um, and then the antenna, which is connected to a receiver, picks up the transmitter uh, signal, and then it gives really accurate data. Um, and I have to be in the field actually tracking the snake. So I really tried to catch one of my snakes that has a transmitter in it, but snakes don't like to be caught. Um, and Instead, I ended up falling into the lake, and it just it wasn't a great time. Um, but I do have the stuff here to kind of demo it. Um, so this is the little transmitter. Like I said, it's about the size of a AA battery. So let's pretend my mother here is a snake that I caught, um, measured to make sure it was OK for me to put the transmitter in it. And then this is the equipment. Um, so you have the antennas or these little things that kind of move, and then um, the transmitter is this little box. So on it, there should be a little code that I read, wrote on it. Um, can you read that code out for me? Hang on. OK, 165. 958. So each transmitter that we have has a little code on it, um, and you put the little code in here, and then it starts picking up the signal. So I'm going to press Enter. And probably turn the volume up so y'all can hear it. That might help. OK, can y'all hear any beeping a little bit? So when I point it closer to my mom, I mean the snake, not my mom, um, <laughs> it's a little bit louder. There we go. Now you can hear it a little bit better. So beeping, loud, away from the snake, not as loud, right? Very loud. So that's what I do in the field. My snakes have those little transmitters in them, um, and I just do that. I stand in the water, and I point. And wherever the noise is loudest, I go that way. And that means that I find myself in situations kind of like this. Um, I'm standing on brush piles because my snake is in the brush pile. So where the snake is, I have to go so I can get a visual on it. Um, and then I'm in water. Wherever the snake is, I am. If it's in water, I'm in water. That means my boots are wet. That means I'm tripping over rocks because they're wet and I'm sliding. I'm getting hurt. Not too hurt, but like, like a safe amount of hurt. Um, <laughs> and then just brush piles. So 
that's that's what field research is. This is what I did um, my entire senior year. This was my free time. This was everything. Um, so I'm going to turn this off. That's, that's getting annoying. Thank you for being a snake, my mom. Um, great job. Proud of you. So go to data gathered here. So start off with, um, you have to get a GPS point, uh, which was then put onto a map, which I will show in a little while, that shows um, just their general habitat every time that I saw them took a GPS point. Um, and then you have uh, weather conditions. So snakes um, are heavily reliant on the weather, on the sun. Um, they go out and bask so they can get higher body temperature, get more energy. Uh, so any weather conditions, if it was cloudy, they might not be as active, uh, things like that. The condition of the subject, so if it is um, coiled up or if it's stretched out, um, if it's about to go and shed, uh, anything like that. Then the habitat, so there's the general habitat and then there's the micro habitat. General habitat is like if it's on, uh, on the land, if it's on the water, um, if it's kind of a mixture, like in a stream but sitting on a log on top of the stream. And then the micro habitat is like within a meter of the snake. So with this snake, which you can see right here, um, the microhabitat would be a bunch of dead leaves that um, she's on. Then temperature of the snake and the environment, um, the little transmitter that's inserted can actually pick up the, um, the temperature of the snakes like inside. Um, the amount of beeps that it gives off per minute, um, take that and there's like this little sheet that says like if it's like 12, then it's a really low temperature. If it's 30, it's like this temperature. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but, and then anything else notable? Um, and that can be like anything with the snake, um, if there's any new injuries that I could see, um, if there's anything like uh, people around that could make the snake move more or not move, depending on the snake and where it's at. So I'm just gonna jump into a little bit of day in the life of a researcher. So um, the snake that I was studying this day is right here. Um, this kind of shows that I find the snake, I get a visual, I take notes, pretty much on top of the snake. Um, <laughs> and then I ended up catching this one because she had just gotten a new um, cut towards her tail and I wanted to get better pictures of it, um, just to document it better. Awesome, snake encounters. So I uh, included these just to kind of see the different habitats that they do use. So fountain is right here. Um, she spends most of her time out of the water around brush piles and she was really hard to see. Uh, there's a lot of, not a lot of days that I got true visuals on her. And then uh, Boathouse is right here. Um, she, that, I spent a good like 45 minutes looking for her for that one because I could not see her and she was literally hiding under some leaves in the water. It was, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, there we go. Um, just to show again um, on the left, or yeah, your left, right here, um, just right on the rock. And then I included the other one to show, like, yeah, I do get bit. Um, you can see right here, bite marks. No, it doesn't hurt. Um, come on, you can do it. There we go. So results, uh, in total I caught 23 snakes. I, only was, I was only able to put transmitters in three of them because they have to be a certain size. Um, and then I spent 81 hours in the field. That's just in the field. That's not really counting driving there and back. It's not counting um, things that I did here, like pit tagging. Um, that's just straight me looking for the snakes. Um, and then 31 movements were recorded. Um, each snake has a nickname. One's Boathouse, one's Fountain, and one's Scarlet. And then uh, percent found in water versus percent found in land. Um, and then you have basking under that. So just because they're on the land doesn't mean they're actually basking. They can be uh, hot, like hidden under a log or something like that. So then we go into GPS points that show their, maybe, that show their um, home range. So uh, Scarlet and Fountain, which is the purple and the red, they were the ones that were found in the, um, the riverine systems. And as you can see, they're very close together. All their GPS points were right on top of each other. But Boathouse, which is the one that was found in the lake, is a little more stretched out. Um, and this kind of shows a little bit better the actual um, water system. So Boathouse spent some time here, mostly in the actual stream. But she did utilize the entire lake shore and both sides of the lake right there. Um, but the other two are still right on the water. And this is just a little um, to get a closer view of those movements between uh, fountain and boathouse. 
So fountain, still, right here, all together, except for the one outlier. Um, and then with boathouse, it's very spread out, very sporadic, um, except for this outlier, or no, this outlier. Yeah, that's, that's the weird one. Um, so that just kind of shows that like their home range is different depending on their habitat. Um, the outlier up here, when I caught or when I got her there, she was in shed. So I think that might have had um, something to do with why she was out of her normal range. And then with this one, um, it was the, one of the very last days that I tracked these snakes, and it was very cold. So I think that uh, that might have been going to her overwintering site. Um, so then, just discussion. So snakes that reside in larger bodies of water, man-made bodies of water, tend to have a larger home range, like boathouse, and then the ones that are in uh, smaller areas, or like the riverine systems, tend to have a smaller home range. Um, I think that's because with the riverine system, all the things that they need are right there. So they have basking opportunities, but they also have um, places that they can hide, and they have good access to food. But with the, with the man-made lake, they have to go um, different areas to get what they need. So with the open lake, there might not be little amphibians there, like uh, like salamanders or salamander larvae or larva um, that they could eat. Um, there might not be brush piles that they can hide in because it's so open. And then I would need to do a bigger study with a bigger sample size instead of just three to see if this is actually true. So let me move in to the second part of this project. It's a lot shorter, I promise. Um, it focused at Bryant Lodge Park, uh, Bryant Lodge Pond, which is actually on campus. Um, and it focused on northern water snakes and midland water snakes. So northern water snakes, kind of already talked about. Um, it's this guy right here. And then the midland water snakes is this one. Um, so midland water snakes are also non-venomous. Um, the color is a little more um, lighter, a little more tan than the northerns. And their, um, their spots right here are more like shadow. Uh, saddles instead of um, blotched or uh, square. So there, there's a little bit of physical differences, um, but there's not been any studies done, like peer-reviewed published research done on Midlands, um, especially compared to Northerns. Um, so I'm trying to catch both of these species. They've both been spotted at uh, the Bryant Pond. Last one of uh, Midland was spotted in 2019 by my advisor, and then the Northern was spotted by me um, early last year. There we go. So this was the area. It's a little um, like a drainage pond, kind of. Um, the goal is to track both of them and see if their behavior um, or movements are similar, if they're different. Um, if there's anything different between these species um, besides just their physical looks, because they were all used to just be classified as northern water snakes, Nerodia sipidon. Uh, now it's Nerodia sipidon sipidon for northern water snakes. And then for Midlands, it's Nerodia sipidon pluralis. Um, so currently, no snakes have been found. Uh, field research doesn't go how you want it to sometimes. I don't have a lab that I can go and grab a snake and just kind of put there. Um, I have to actually catch them in, in their element. Um, but currently working on it, um, I will be in the area for the, at least another year, um, so I'll be able to continue this research. Um, so with that, I just want to do some acknowledgments, maybe. OK, so acknowledgments. Um, just the honors program in general for giving me this, these funds uh, to continue with the, with these honors program, um, this project. And then um, <laughs> SCICU, uh, South Carolina Independent College and Universities, they gave me a grant to do the first part of this project at Table Rock. And then um, Table Rock State Park, obviously, for letting me use, um, use their snakes there and use their facilities. And then I guess my advisor, he's OK. Um, he, he helped me out a little bit. Uh, he kind of kind of threw me out there and just told me to catch snakes. I didn't really know what I was doing, but it's fine. Um, and with that, I'll open up with questions. Um, yes, I've been bit. No, not by a venomous snake. No, I don't know how many times I've been bit. No, it doesn't hurt. Any other questions? I think I covered those. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a good sample size honestly depends on how much time the researcher has, um, because with field research, especially with these, uh, you want to have at least two plus years of research. Um, <laughs> so I would say, 
I would definitely want to have at least like five to eight in each um, in each habitat because I can't base everything off of one snake moving in a large system and then two based on like in a small. Um, and then with the hypothesis, it was more of just like a general study. I wanted to see if it would even affect, like if the habitat would affect anything. Um, I didn't really have a guess because going into this, I didn't have much knowledge on their habitat. Um, and they're like just, just different home ranges and stuff like that, so not really. But um, just learning how they operate now and just the behavior and movements, it would make sense um, that they have to go where their needs are met. Any others? Yes. Yeah, so um, being at Table Rock, it's a very popular spot, and most of the snakes are pretty um, pretty accustomed to being around people. Um, the snake that y'all that you saw when I was basically on top of it, like they really aren't that affected by my presence, but I'm also not trying to poke at them or screaming at them because I see a snake and I think it's a, a copper mouth, you know. Um, <laughs> That's, that's, a, that's a joke, it's copperhead and cotton mouth. I just, yeah, it's a joke, I promise, I know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, I think that my presence didn't, but I also tried to see the snake first before it saw me. Um, and then I would take data, and then take pictures to get a little closer, um, just in case it did see me and take off. But just from, just the little, th uh, little bit that I did with these snakes for the four or five months that I've tracked them, there wasn't really much. Yes, Dr. Moore. So definitely with the riverine systems, I think it's going to be more focused on amphibians. Um, with Table Rock, there's a lot of like salamanders you can find there, a lot of black belly salamanders, and I think that they would prey more on that than fish. Um, there's not going to be a lot of fish that are going through uh, not sizable fish, it'd be like minnows or like just little fish. Um, and then with the open lake, I feel like it is more fish based, um, just like with sunfish or brim or whatever they're called here, I have no idea. Um, just more fish based. And then with Bryant, I feel like it could be a mixture. Um, Bryant Pond actually connects into a tiny stream where you can find salamanders down there and then there's also fish in it. So I think there'd be more of a mixture there. Yes, Matt. There were so many people. Yeah, I was actually surprised because people wanted to go with me to track snakes. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be out in the field for six hours. It's not going to be great. Like, we're going to be in streams, and there's going to be around snakes. I had a lot of people. Um, I had one of my sweet mates. I had a couple of my best friends. I took my mom one time. Um, the only person I haven't really taken is Dr. Moore. Huh. <laughs> Surprising. <laughs> so it, it was a lot of people. It was a lot of efforts that I had here just to just have people there just in case something did happen. So. Anything else? Yes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I've had some people go out twice, which is very surprising. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that came from Waldrop Stone Falls, um, and they're both juveniles, so I wouldn't be able to track those anyways. Um, and uh, you caught that, which is funny, because you're asking that question, and you know where it came from, but <laughs> yes. I understand you want credit, but this is my presentation. So, <laughs> so anything else? Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I realized I introduced the students and I didn't introduce myself. I'm Laura Timmerman, I'm a professor in the School of Business and I'm also the interim director for the honors program. So as in that role, I wanna thank you all for coming out today. I know this is a busy time of year for everyone. Um, and if you are able to, please stay and celebrate these students with us. If you have questions that you didn't wanna ask or you wanna find out you know, what's next for them, please stay for some light refreshments that are hopefully already set up in the breezeway just outside. There's also restrooms in the building and joining us if you need to make use of the facilities. So thank you again for coming out um, and I hope to see you next year. <laughs>